do this for the safety of yourself, for the safety of others, and we can get through it. There will be an end to the pandemic. I think that was the general consensus in China. I was not concerned about my privacy at all. As Western countries battle new COVID-19 waves and fight for access to vaccines, China's economy is back on track. Its streets are bustling and its infection rate is low. In January 2020, Wuhan was forced into one of the strictest lockdowns in the world. The city faced tough restrictions until the middle of the year. But much of the country regained normalcy within a few months. With 2003's SARS outbreak still in memory, people were quick to take precautions and follow the advice of public health experts. They also downloaded Jiankang Ma, or a health code, a new government-developed software for smartphones, which tracks users' locations and collects data in an effort to curb the spread of the virus. The question is, to regain this level of freedom in a pandemic, must citizens give up their right to privacy? And can this data be trusted to any one state? Shanghai resident Lillian Lee stayed with her parents at the beginning of the pandemic, but returned to her home after a few weeks. So it's been a year since the restrictions have been lifted in Shanghai, and I think my life has been normal since day one of when the restrictions were lifted. I think that is because everyone is so aware of what bad things could happen if we don't listen to what is being expected of us. We rely on our phones so much and therefore we're giving up our data and our privacy on a daily basis and there hasn't been any negative consequences yet. And the Health Code app has had positive consequences. I can go out and live my normal life and not be in a lockdown like so many other people around the world. Honestly, I haven't thought about if there would be any negative consequences, but I've seen the positive consequences. So that's all I'm thinking of at the moment. I think people outside of China don't understand how much we rely on our mobile phones here. So everyone pays through their phone and all your bank cards are connected to Alipay, which means your identification is also connected to Alipay. So pretty much what the government did was just uh, introduce, I guess, like a mini program or an app within an app of Alipay and you open it. And I don't even think you had to put in your information. You could just like press connect all my information from Alipay onto this, you know, mini program. And then it would just track your location from where you've been in the past 14 days. In China, health codes dictate freedom of movement. The software varies between local authorities. But in Shanghai, a QR code embedded with personal information is generated for each user and is color coded. Green for safe, yellow for a seven day quarantine and red for a 14 day quarantine. The software tracks users as they go about their everyday lives through cell phone geolocations or from scanning QR code locations. Big data is then used to analyze whether someone poses a contagion risk. There's a serious lack of transparency as to how this all works, but it's believed that in Shanghai, when a person is in the vicinity of an infected individual or enters a high-risk area, the software will register it and your code will change colour from green to yellow or red. Chinese authorities credit this constant tracking with enabling the country to keep COVID cases low while avoiding large-scale lockdowns. However, this lack of transparency has led to complaints 
that QR codes can turn red without a clear reason as to why. Health codes are hosted by two of China's biggest tech titans, Tencent's messaging app WeChat and Alibaba's mobile payment app Alipay, both of which are used by hundreds of millions of people. I use so many apps that are already owned by those companies, which I'm sure also have relations to the government already, you know, like everything I purchase online or even um, social media apps, all of that. Cities in China are under the heaviest CCTV surveillance in the world, with 18 out of the top 20 most surveilled cities being in China. The rapid rise of cheap Chinese-made smartphones and an expansive mobile internet network across the country has also given the government more access to data than ever before. There is an acceptance, if not disillusionment, that privacy from the government does not exist, but that perhaps there is safety in surveillance. I think a lot of countries need to change their way of thinking to not only think about themselves, but think about those around them. The health code, along with other measures, has helped foster a sense of life as usual in China. But the technology has its critics. Human rights activists fear that the unknown data it collects could be weaponized against marginalized communities. And an analysis by the New York Times found that the software appears to share information with the police. International human rights law is pretty clear about, about public emergencies and what states can and can't do. But I would say that the Chinese government hasn't even met the minimum threshold of having some kind of conversation with people across the country you know, about the necessity, the legitimacy and the proportionality of something like the health code app. This year, the US State Department accused China of genocide against Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. The alleged crimes against humanity include the arbitrary imprisonment of over one million civilians. China strongly refutes these claims. In a way, privacy rights are, are gateway rights to other kinds of protections. And so, for example, we have uh, documented how a police app used in Xinjiang has effectively criminalized uh, dozens of different kinds of behavior and people have no ability uh, to challenge that reality or even really opt out of how data is being gathered about them. It's called the Integrated Joint Operations Platform. And I think that presents a very frightening picture of how this state can and will use technology to seriously limit people's rights. I think the government has no intention of, of rolling back its use of this and other technologies. And I think there's sort of a, a dual imperative. On the one hand, authorities are trying to use technology in a way that suggests to people it can make their lives easier and sort of provide certain kinds of services in you know, very real time. But the flip side of that is that authorities are gathering massive amounts of data about people and in some cases using it against them in ways that are not only illegal, but again, against this rights-free backdrop uh, that I think has real consequences in the longer term as the state sort of strives to, pr to produce a dissent-free society. The streets of Shanghai are a far cry from Xinjiang. Here, under the guidance of the Chinese Communist Party, the city has rapidly developed into a global financial hub. Its residents are fiercely proud of what the country and the government have achieved. This sentiment is echoed across China, with the majority of citizens rating the government as more capable than ever before. The COVID case in China was never really, really high. I think it was always under control. We were suggested not to open any business during that time of the period. I think the idea was very collective. Nobody wanted to do anything. No, nobody wanted to risk their uh, lives. 
So we had SARS, so that experience really helped us. So whatever the doctor and the government told us, we would just follow. China isn't the only country in the world using technology to try and stop transmission of the coronavirus. Some experts worry that pre-pandemic privacy norms may never be returned. This is a historical inflection point where we get to choose which path we go down, whether we continue to allow IoT tracking, this perpetual surveillance to become the norm of how our society functions, or whether we push back and, and allow for a very different future, one where we still have the autonomy, the independence that's essential to a democracy. I, we could see in you know just a few years a, a, an America that looks much more like Beijing today, where we see American police officials able to track people in real time, where they're are able to use predictive policing technology that evaluates us and judges us based upon our actions. The U.S. is already closer to the dystopian surveillance state than we like to admit. China has always been a world leader on surveillance. It continues in this pandemic to expand in the amount of data it's collecting on others, going beyond what we see in any other country. But at the same time, we see China continuing to try to export its surveillance model to other countries around the world and to try to hold out its approach as being a better alternative to the openness of a more democratic society. History will most likely dictate whether this alternative approach is justified and if privacy should be sacrificed for safety. But as the pandemic rages on in the West, China is marching forward towards its post-pandemic future.